Good morning, uh, happy Friday, and welcome to our webinar on, um, we're, we're going, to, uh, Sustainable Newton is part of our series of webinars this uh, fall. We've asked uh, Alyssa Brown to join us today. We're going to spend some time, particularly with the Great Georgia Pollinator Census starting this week, today and tomorrow, we're gonna spend time talking with Alyssa about, um, about pollinators specifically, about photographing them, but uh, also um, Alyssa does a wonderful job of photographing nature in a lot of ways, and so we're gonna share some of her photos as we go along. Uh, this is kind of a role reversal for me. The first time, or one of the first times I met Alyssa was actually when she was hosting a radio show here in Covington on our AM station called the Alley Bug Hour. So she was interviewing me, now I get to interview her. And uh, the show was the Alley Bug Hour. I remember the song, I tried to find it this morning that Johnny Rockmore did. <laughs> I would love to play that, you've probably got it somewhere. Uh, but uh, the, the Alley Bug Hour, and then uh, I know your email address is Bug Lovey. So from right. that conversation back then, um, I know that bugs, insects, the insect world have been important to you for a long time. So before we start talking about how you get these great photographs, I thought maybe you could just give our uh, listeners a little insight into how you became so fascinated with bugs. Well, uh, I played outside an awful lot. I had a sister that was not an outdoorsy person, so I was a, I had to be a play-by-yourself person. And um, and, you know, not, not to take away from my sister, she was a little bit bossy and kind of would take my things. It was better for me to find something to play with outside. And then because if I had a doll, she wanted the doll and, you know, all, all of that kind of stuff, this little sibling stuff going on. So anyway, I just enjoyed the outside. I think that's sort of in my genes. But as children in my community, and a lot of you may remember this, if you're old enough, uh, I'm beginning to get a little little age on me, it feels like, especially during these times, because time is just going so fast. I don't know what's happening. But um, when I was growing up, we played with doodle bugs, where you put a little stick in a doodle bug hole and you twirled it around, and this little mm -hmm. bug called an ant lion, you know, would come yes. and... And I remember even trying to feed the little thing ants. So I went to look for ants and I'd put a little ant and, you know, on the side of a little mound and see if the little ant lion would get it. And it would. That's pretty mean, I think. But, you know, well, I, had to, I had to see if the name was real. You yeah, know, were those, an the ant one, were those the ones with the big... Yes, yeah, yeah. With, the, with the pincers. <laughs> yes. And the weirdest thing about an ant lion is that the... Um, the I think the ant lion is actually just the larva, and it, and it makes this moth thing that's way bigger than the ant lion and totally beautiful. It has pink on it and black lacy wings, pink and black lacy wings, and um, I don't think I gave you a picture of that. And then the other thing that you know kids would do, I never did this. I heard of it. We played with June bugs and people would tie strings around their legs or a leg yeah. <laughs> and let the zoom bu June bug just go sailing, you know, through the air. It's like, you know, you couldn't afford to go to the store and buy a remote controlled <laughs> airplane and they didn't have them back then. So we just used June bugs. And there was a little bee, actually, it's called a surfid fly. I know now as a sort of, sort of a bug person, I'm not, I'm not a professional. But you could hold your finger out, and that little bee would come and light on your finger. We called them Billy Bees, and we would yep. we would sing to them, you know, "Come, little Billy Bee," and and uh, the little bee would light on your finger. So, uh, lightning bugs, of course, we would put in jars and let them light up. So, I did have an amazing fascination with bugs, and I was constantly find, finding a cicada. Uh, shells where a cicada had hatched and I would collect those and put them in a little jar and just you know they wouldn't move but they look like bugs so um, I, I've always had an interest in in everything nature and watching these same bugs on flowers and just crawling across the ground and um, the funny thing about bugs is just the more you look at them the more you really see the beauty in them. And some of them are just extraordinarily colored. Like a June bug is a pretty bug, but this is weird. 
the underside of a June bug is a lot prettier than the outside of the June bug itself because it's gold and it has all of these amazing prismatic colors in that shell, especially when the sun hits it. That's why so, you hold it on um, that string so you can look up. <laughs> yeah, yeah, if you have a little line along on the string, you could do that. So, and they're little green bees. One of my favorite bees is a little bee called the Georgia Sweat Bee, and it's emerald green and it's got the most amazing eyes if you can get a good enough shot of it to get really the, the eye. A carpenter bee, a male carpenter bee, not the female, but the male has a green eye also and it's a, it's very striated and it has a pretty pattern in it and I, you know, I don't know, I'm just, I'm an extremely observant person so that's kind of how my my bug life started. <laughs> well, I think a testament to, to your, um, how closely you pay attention in some of the photographs. And so what I want to do is, is bring some of those up and share them as we go along. And, and then, you know, selfishly, I'd like to, to understand more about how you go about capturing some of the shots that you do. And I'm sure the folks that have joined this do as well. So let me just get this going. Hopefully we can share that. And uh, then, so again, you know, I just maybe let folks know how you started getting into photographing of the insects. Well, I've, I've actually been photographing them for, for a really long time. I started out with a little Nikon, um, I guess, a sort of Instamatic camera, but it may have been a little digital camera. I can't remember quite what kind it was, but I know that it made very good pictures. And it even had a little zoom lens on it that you could zoom up close and once you really zoom into an insect and you really start seeing the different scales and patterns that make up the colors and you see the knobs on the antennas it, it sort of changes your whole world about taking a picture of an insect so what happened with me was is when i got on facebook one day and this has been years ago to around 2007 2008 i was scrolling around and came across a photo of a dragonfly. And I love dragonflies. It's just one of my favorite bugs. And the photo was made by a guy named Pete Moulton. And I was looking on his, his profile, don't even know how I came across the picture, and he lived in Arizona. Well, I friended him, or he friended me. I don't know how this happened, but he was really big into dragonflies. It's a class called Odinata and he would take these excellent pictures and i just thought to myself man i want to do that you know so the longer i commented on his photos and and then he would come back and say alisa you should probably have this one in georgia you know look for this one so and so and then i started saying well how are you getting these pictures i mean i i want to do what you're doing and you know, there's my green sweat bee yeah. But um, I said, I want to do what you're doing. So he told me about the Canon uh, 100 millimeter macro lens. I've got it right here. And it's a kind of a, I don't know if you can see it because it's, um, yeah. but it's a sort of a short lens, you know, about six inches long or whatever. And you can get within about 12 inches of a flower with a bug on it or flower, anything. And it just takes a very, very sharp picture. And what a macro lens does is just brings things real close to you as opposed to a zoom lens that you can zoom way out, you know, and, and take some pretty good pictures from, you know, for, with things a long way off. Now, I'm going to tell you something interesting about that. That macro lens is not a very, very cheap lens. It's a fairly pricey lens. But I discovered also that with a zoom lens, and I do have a zoom lens here, and uh, I don't know if that can be seen either, mm -hmm. but um, this is a 100, 400 millimeter Canon uh, zoom lens, which I use these days for binoculars. It's great being able to go out and take pictures of birds and not have to have binoculars to find the bird. And, um, but, these photos, a lot of them were taken with that zoom lens, which means that I can stand back a good distance from the bug insect, like that one right there, and take a, that was a long way back because that one's not very up close, but um, I can stand a good piece back from the bug, so therefore you're not disturbing the bug, 
And this lens is so sharp that you get a picture pretty much as good as that macro lens, you know, will provide for you. So, um, and then as far as settings for my camera, I'm, I'm pretty cheap on that. I'm just going to be completely honest. Uh, I use an aperture priority setting, which is either an A or an AV on the camera. And what that does is that allows how much, um, it allows how the light works in your camera. And, and the thing about it is, is that um, it, it, it sort of uh, sets a specific value and it's then the aperture, when you put it on aperture priority, that automatically makes the camera select a shutter speed. So you don't have to do that yourself. So it's, it's kind of an automatic way of taking pictures, but it's not quite automatic. And I have gone and done settings on cameras when you're doing something like a nighttime moonshot or something, um, you have to pretty much go back and do some manual settings. And another thing that manual settings have to be used for are hummingbirds in flight because they're extremely fast. And if you really want to freeze those wings, You've got to use a really fast shutter speed and a high ISO, which means uh, your light that's coming into the camera or whatever. And it's all got to work perfectly to get that little hummingbird and freeze those wings. That's really difficult to do. I am in no means a professional photographer because if you're a Facebook person and if you've been on Facebook for a while, let me tell you, there are some real professional photographers on Facebook. And I'm just blown away on a constant basis about what I see in photography because some of these people are just unreal. But um, like I said, a lot of these bugs, uh, as a matter of fact, I would say probably most of these bugs were not made with uh, my macro lens. They were made with my uh, Canon zoom lens. Now, so, so the you know there's the technical side of it, which is you just went through, and and but I think on the other side of this, the thing I'm curious about is the creative side and the passion of this, which is, I would like, do you go out and set up and wait for the right shot to come along, or are you just no. out there and say, wow, look at that? No, <laughs> and you know that's that's been a question that I have gotten a lot. It's like, how do you get these pictures and I, I can only attribute to what's around me, maybe to my parents, to the land that I live on. And, and I live in my home place now and on the homeland that I grew up on. My, my mom and dad were very strict about not using chemicals. And I mean, I think my dad maybe may have used Roundup twice in my life. And that was only after it came on the market because when I was a little girl, nothing like that existed. When we went to our garden, one of the favorite meals for a Japanese beetle that looks kind of like a June bug, but is not, it's an invasive, uh, bad insect, quite, quite pretty, quite interesting looking insect, looks, does look kind of like a June bug, it's got a green shell on it, and, um, but one of its favorite meals are green beans, so we always had a garden when I was growing up, and there was always a day when all of a sudden the Japanese beetles were invading and we were down there with buckets of water with a little bit of soap in them, picking those blasted Japanese beetles off of those green beans. And you know, Japanese beetles may be pollinators. I've seen them sitting on flowers, but mostly what they want to do is eat your vegetables <laughs> and, and, and things like that. that that's him right there's there. There's one. <laughs> yeah, there's one <laughs> right there, sure as we speak. And so, um, and I don't know what that one, that was, he was sitting on Queen Anne's Lace. I'm not quite sure why, probably just a place to rest. But, um, but there were no, there were no chemicals used here. And I think another reason for that is because we had a deep well. And my mother was always afraid that anything that was put into the yard was going to get, you know, into the well, you know, into the groundwater. And I think it has made a healthy and safe haven for just lots of different kinds of butterflies and birds. And they, my mom and dad started feeding birds. I know when I was about six years old, I'm not gonna tell you how old I am now, but that was a long time ago. They didn't have a bird feeder, so they just cast bird seed on the ground. 
and we had a little spot in our backyard where um where the birds would come and just you know peck the seeds off the ground um interesting about that there's a little bird called a uh, um a junco a uh, slate colored junco that used to come here in this yard in flocks i mean there might have been 200 out you know pecking those little seeds when i was a little girl and could watch them out the window i'm lucky if i see one in the winter now and that's that is really really sad to me that you know and, and something and that has happened all over it's not just here I, you know it's a little bird that i think they've declined in this area a whole lot but um getting back to the chemicals in the garden other than picking bugs off the only thing I can remember my dad using as a chemical was seven dust and it was put on dogs for fleas and it was put, uh, you know, it was, it was, it was just put on everything. It seemed like, but it was sprinkled, you know, under around the leaves of your vegetables, not on the flowers. And that's a real old thing. And I don't know if it's a horrible chemical. I know it was used for many, many years. And then they came out with some more powerful uh, chemicals to use on vegetables and things. And, um, and then they used real organic fertilizers. And I, I would say that growing up, I was talking to a friend about this, we must have had the true meaning of organic gardens because mm -hmm. cow manure was used for fertilizer, chicken manure, and, um, this like i said the seven dust would be the only thing i guess that it would exclude that and there was a fertilizer i can remember my dad talking about called guana to this day i can hear the word i can hear him saying i have a, no idea what it is <laughs> so if somebody wants to uh answer that at some time you know on facebook what is guana how do you even spell it but um i think that's why going back to i believe it's just kind of a this is sort of a healthy atmosphere well, so something, something magical for sure because I mean you and I probably live five miles apart and you you have birds and insects <laughs> all kind of critters that I know we don't see here of course I live closer to town but uh, right it's amazing well, the variety of say, birds that you see pass through there well you know that's kind of actually sort of an interesting thing to me I mean even though my mom and dad fed birds I know that they were not nearly as into, especially my mother would have been the one, you know, that would be interested in this, but um, I know that they didn't understand the migration paths and the migrating birds and which birds were and which birds were not. They certainly, my mother certainly didn't knew native songbirds and uh, was very familiar with them her whole life. Her mother was a real natural kind of person too. And, but we live on uh, we live down in the high point community which a long time ago was thought to be the highest point in newton county and then it that changed and i think cornish mountain now is supposed to be the highest point in newton county i'm not quite sure but i am on a high spot in newton county i've always wondered if that had anything to do with the migratory path of the birds if for some reason that high spot hey they're closer to the ground when they fly over my area so they get to rest a little sooner. You know, I, I have no idea. But anyway, it's a weird thought I had. Well, we, we mentioned at the start about the, the great Georgia pollinator census. And so uh, one, one question I have is, are you going to be counting today or tomorrow? If it's not raining, I'm going to try to get out and count. Uh, <laughs> I have uh, favorite plants that I like to look for pollinators on. Um, I might tell you what some of those are. As a matter of fact, the, I'm a, also a member of the Satsuki Garden Club in Covington, and we have a pollinator garden. And before long, I'm going to be taking some pictures or maybe using some I already have. Um, there's a new kiosk over there where we're going to put some pictures and identify insects and plants that they are on as pollinators, and um, and so that's something I'm going to be doing. But a lot of my favorite plants are over there in that garden, and I know that some of our garden members are going to be over there counting, hopefully today and tomorrow. This is today and tomorrow, and all you have to do is, is for 15 minutes, right? Is that it? Yeah, it's yeah, and then and there's, there's that. 
And I'll, I'll go um, share a, a, a quick snapshot of our website before we wrap up. And on there, we have links to the, uh, it's a pretty simple process, but they have, you know, counting guide, I mean, identification guides and then a little sheet to use. And, and then when you're done, you record your, what you saw in your 15 minutes and uh, upload it to the website. So I'll right. share before we go, but uh, and you mentioned the set suit. I mean, the uh, pollinator garden there at Academy Springs. We we Sustainable Newton had events last year for the for the uh, census where we invited people to come join us. We put the literature out and kind of help people, you know, through the process. We chose, and one of those was at the pollinator garden, which is an amazing place. I mean, it, it is uh, an amazing place. Yeah. We had a little bit of trouble with it this year because of rain and there was some washing and it ruined some plants. But over at that pollinator garden are some of my very, very favorite um, uh, plants that for, for pollinators to use. And I might mention a couple of those if it's okay. Yeah. But, but asters are one of the things that pollinators are explicitly fond of and we have an aster in Georgia that's native it's called a Georgia aster and it just blooms profusely with these little purple flowers they have some of these over at the pot well they did the last time I was there over at the pollinator garden and they just attract all kinds of bees and bugs and even beetles and um and things milkweed is one that everybody should plant for monarchs because uh, I imagine a lot of people that are listening to this know that monarchs, the monarch butterfly has been in decline. And one of the reasons is for loss of habitat. And if you'll remember um, years ago, going down a dirt road or even down a paved highway, along the sides of the road, you'd see this gorgeous orange plant blooming in these little clusters. Well, more than likely what you were seeing was a, um, Asclepius uh, tuberosa, I believe, Asclepius is kind of hard to say, tuberosa, but that's a butterfly weed. And that's one of the main plants that butterflies, monarch butterflies stopping in Georgia use for their food. And unfortunately, road work and grading and right of way, the right of way is so huge now, you know, by the sides of roads that it takes it just, you know, just decimates this, this food for these gorgeous butterflies. Um, another one is uh, ageratum. That's not a native plant, but it's an old plant that people used to plant. It's a form of eupatorium, and it has a purple kind of a fuzzy blue purple bloom on it. Butterflies love that one. There's a white eupatorium that is wild, and you will see that right now growing along the sides of roads, and it's kind of a it looks kind of like ageratum. It's a fuzzy white bloom, and I think a lot of people call it bone set. That might be the sort of the common name. Joe pie weed is another one. Great big tall weed that lots of times you will see kind of along stream beds, of, um, along with iron weed, which is a gorgeous, very tall, beautiful purple bloom. And then one of my favorite, Mexican sunflower. That's not native here. But oh my gosh, it's this bright orange uh, sunflower and the monarchs love it, viceroys, all the butterflies, the little yellow sulfur butterflies just love it. And, and hummingbirds, because we shouldn't leave out the fact that hummingbirds are definitely pollinators. Y'all need to remember that. So You said, um, you, you mentioned very tall and I was gonna make that point that you know, you can't appreciate very tall until you go over to that pollinator garden and walk through it. You, right, go through, right. you go through the arch or in from the other side and I mean, in no yeah. time at all, you forget you're in downtown Covington. It feels like- Yeah, that, uh, yeah those, uh, those iron weeks kind of got away from us a little bit over there. But Another it's, thing- It's, it's I, impressive. I, and real quick, so, somebody was asking so for sure. but the, uh, the garden that we're talking about is in Academy Springs Park, which is near the Lions Club Pavilion. So if you're at all familiar with downtown Covington, it's basically at the corner of Conyers Street and, and uh, Legion Drive. So, right. And I'll try to paste a, a link to, the, to the, the Google Map link in the chat here before we're done. So, it's anyway. a beautiful little garden and a lot of work has been done in it and it's a uh, it's a really nice place to go to just be quiet and just look at all these insects and 
you'll see lizards, you'll see birds in there, and it's right there by the pond. It's a real serene place and beautiful. So we, that's we a actually, good thing to do. It, when folks go to our website or our YouTube channel, you'll see a video out there too that was shot in that um, garden. And we, we had Connie and David Waller uh, were very kind to join us for uh, doing that video. Um, not exactly at the time of uh, uh, census last year, but shortly after that. And so it's a good insight to go and watch that. You'll also get a good look at the uh, pollinator garden and also hear a little bit more about how it came to be. Um, you know, one, one of the things we might want to mention, too, is just be being very, very careful about talking about the chemicals while ago, about what you use in your own garden, you know, to take care of insects or bugs or whatever it is that you don't want. And uh, if that's not bad enough, just spraying things, you know, around your plants in your garden, some of the big box stores, especially in some years past, and I believe they've tried to clean this up, have been growing plants or bu buying plants that have been grown with a systemic poison yeah. in them called neonicotinoids. And what this systemic poison does is it comes up through the roots of the plant. It goes all the way up to the bloom. And which means now this bloom is essentially poisoned. Right. Then a honeybee comes along, even a hummingbird. I wonder how this stuff has affected hummingbirds over the years. Honeybees, butterflies, ladybugs, all other kinds of pollinating beetles and, and other pollinating bugs. And then they, they start, you know, eat, collecting this pollen, uh, which is their food, you know, and it's got this chemical in it and it kills honeybees because it paralyzes them through their nervous system. Mm -hmm. And so that's, that's a real big thing to watch too. When you're buying plants, they're supposed to be labeled. Make sure you don't get those that have the neonicotinoids in them. Right. We've got a couple other questions here in the chat while I'm looking. At okay. Um, one is kind of these two go together. One is have, have you guys planted any bee balm in the garden? And then the other question was any black and blue salvia? Yes, I've got black and blue salvia. Black and blue salvia is is not really a favorite of my um, bug pollinators, but it is a favorite for my hummingbirds. And I do see butterflies on it. Uh, black and blue salvia has a, a very kind of a long, about an inch and a half, sometimes at least an inch though, a tube flower. So whatever bug comes to pollinate that plant or, or you know, get nectar from it, it's gonna have to have a really long proboscis because it's kind of a tubed flower. Hummingbirds have no problem with that. And that's a gorgeous plant. It's a pretty plant for your garden. And, and it does attract pollinators, I would say. Bee balm definitely attracts pollinators and bees. And um, it's also very good for hummingbirds too, especially that red one. So bee balm is also called Monarda. But um, yes, those are very, very good plants for the garden. And I didn't, I didn't really say this up front, but for anybody else that has a question, um, would like to type it in the Q&A on the um, Zoom meeting or in the chat, either one, we'll, we'll get those to Lisa and let her answer. Um, <laughs> if I can. <laughs> yeah. And uh, Deborah Griffith is uh, mentioning she's seen honeybees sucking from the base of her black and blue salvia. Yeah, I don't know what is at the base of it. That's an interesting thing. I think I've seen that too, but I mean, it makes me wonder, does the nectar kind of leak out <laughs> you know, yeah. at, the, at, the, at the base of the flower? So that's something I'll have to be more observant with, I guess. But, um, you know, when you're, uh, when you're thinking about protecting the bees, there's some things that you can do. Uh, one of the things that you can do is just make sure you follow the label instructions. A lot of people think that more is better, but it's not with chemicals because you obviously do not want to just inundate things with chemicals. Uh, so that's one thing you shouldn't do. Please don't apply pesticides when you see pollinators flying. Try to do it at a time of the day where things have gotten kind of still and quiet and you don't see a lot of butterflies and you don't see a lot of bees because it is going to affect them if this, most, most of, a lot of these things are just very particulated very finely 
I guess like the coronavirus, I don't know. And they, they can just really, you know, reach out and grab those insects and, and make them very sick or kill them. Uh, early evening is usually about the best time to do this. You never, ever, ever want to put out any kind of, especially a dusty kind of a chemical when the wind is blowing. You don't want to do that even with um, glyphosate, Roundup or whatever, when the wind is blowing because you're going to, you might end up, you know, that stuff blowing onto some of your blooming flowers that you don't want messed with. And um, so the basic thing is just using when you're, if you feel like you've got to use poisonous chemicals, just use common sense. Make sure you read the label and, you know, follow the instructions. That's usually the best way to keep something bad from happening. So that's, uh, that's another thing. Um, you know, one of the things uh, I can tell you about too is that obviously if you really want to sustain the pollinators in, in your area uh, or the ones that have been there for a long time or the ones that left and should come back, what you need to do is plant native plants. Yeah. And we have a good many sources in Georgia that provide us native plants. They are not as inexpensive as they are in normal nurseries, but um, Pike's Nursery down in uh, down at Lake Oconee actually has some native plants. Uh, they don't really deal a whole lot with native plants, but um, there is a uh, nursery over in McDonough, Georgia called Nearly Native, and they are native plants. And then there is a, um, there is a, I know another one and I have lost the name of that one now for some reason. There, there are a number of them. There's actually one in our neighboring state of South Carolina called Woodlanders mm -hmm. and they do a lot of shrubs and, and they're very much native plants. Oh, I know which one I was talking about, thinking about is um, over in Lexington, Georgia, there's a place called Goodness Grows. Yes. And they have been there for, I don't know, 30 years, maybe, maybe longer than that. These guys are really, really interesting. And these guys are where, this is, I didn't mention this plant and I can't remember, I can't believe I didn't do it. But they are where Miss Huff Lantana came from. Oh yeah. Yep. Now, if any of you know about Miss Huff Lantana, I'm, talk about pollinators. Mm -hmm. That is one of the best pollinators in the world. So, it makes these gorgeous bright orange and yellow and pink and white flowers. Uh, I mean, very, very bright. And the interesting thing about this lantana is one of the only lantanas that will come up year after year. It's a, it's a perennial lantana, but it gets bigger too. I mean, uh, as it comes up, it, when it finally gets to its maturity, it's a fairly large bush. It can be about five feet tall and about five feet wide and it's, it's a large bush, but if you see a bush like that blooming, that's just covered, covered yeah. in like 15 swallowtail butterflies or something and skippers and, and uh, long tail skippers and just, you know, little yellow butterflies and just all kinds of things. That's an amazing um, uh, pollinator plant. So everybody to me ought to have a Miss Huff Lantana. Just need to put it where if it kind of grows out of control, it's okay some things do. But these guys have gone out into different places where I guess there were plant spotters, you know, and um, I'm a bug spotter and a bird spotter and they're plant spotters too. And they have gone to old homesteads and discovered plants that have grown there for years and years and years and they didn't die over the winter. And they, they dug them up and took them back to their um, nursery and started propagating the plants and then um, they became these these real winners as far as you know plants go. That's what happened to Miss Huff. There was a lady, uh, I want to say she lived in Athens, I'm not quite sure, but this lantana was growing in her backyard and it had been growing there for 10 years and the winters had never killed it. And so she told these guys about it one day, so they went over and got some cuttings. That's where and her name was Miss Huff, and that's where Miss Huff Lantana came from. So Miss Huff is all over the southeastern United States now, but it's a Georgia girl. 
just to let you know, so one of our I, best pollinators. I, I stopped sharing the, the screen, the slideshow, but it's still playing on the background in my computer. And I just saw the lantana pop up that you were talking about. So. Yeah, right. Yeah, it's, a, it's an amazing uh, thing. Okay, now my screen just went away. Are we out uh, of time? Yeah, I, I just, I'm, I, I, before we wrap up, I wanted to just uh, both share with folks some of the links to find out more about yes. the census today and then but uh, one of the things I mentioned earlier on our homepage is the uh, some of the videos that we did the past um, the past we did a, actually had a conversation a couple of weeks ago with a couple of folks from the Georgia Extension Service about the census how to do the census so this would be a good resource for folks who happen to be on the day that want to get a little more you know understanding maybe it's raining now watch that and then when the sun comes out later it got pop outside but uh, we also have as I mentioned the, 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 the video we did with Connie and David at the uh, Academy Springs Park in the Satsuki Garden uh, Pollinator Garden so that's a short little video that's fun to watch as well um, in our calendar You'll find all of the events like this one today, but we've also got links in there for the for the census. So, um, you know, information on link to their website and uh, and their Facebook group, so that um, you can get more information today. But the census is today and tomorrow, and basically it's just 15 minutes sometime during the day. And uh, then you know you go online and upload it. And some of the questions I had last year were really around, well, how scientific is this? What is going to be done with this data? And in that 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 webinar we had a couple of weeks ago, uh, Becky Griffin from the uh, UGA Extension Service did a good job of explaining why it's so important, why citizen science is so important, and what it does for us. So. Uh, we, we of course had this session today, the census tomorrow, but we also want to make folks aware we've got um, coming up in the 1st of September, um, actually the 12th through the 19th, there's a film called 2040, which is uh, created by a filmmaker in Australia. It's a very uplifting, um, positive story. He, he was looking at you know, the world that his his five-year-old daughter was going to grow up in and wondering about you know, climate change and the effects. So he, he started to delve into all the things that are being done in the science world and in, in, you, know, in the, uh, uh, you know, in technology to address these things and produce a film that's a, a really exciting look at the fact that we have all the things we need today to address this, but it's done in a very, uh, gentle and kind way so we're going to have that screening which if you go to this link on our website you can register and then uh, the day before the, the 12th you'll get a link to stream the film yourself individually and then coming back together on the 17th we're going to have a panel discussion we've got some young people some people in the solar industry people in the renewable agricultural industry who are going to join us to kind of talk about the ideas presented in the film and then following that up in October, we have a screening of another film, The Story of Plastic, a panel discussion to go with that. And we've also got another a session, sort of like the one today with Elisa, where um, we've got a, a filmmaker out of Minnesota, Erica Gilsdorf, who is going to be, um, she, she, she's embarked on a, on a journey to uh, tell stories about um, people doing things for the environment, doing things for climate change around the world, and she's going to come see us here in the southeast. She was going to come this fall, and then with the status of the pandemic, she decided to go to the northwest, come down the west coast this fall, and then come see us in the spring, but she's going to join us virtually uh, in October, and we're going to talk with with Erica about her plans and the story she's telling. So, uh, Alyssa, Lisa, thank you very much for sharing your um, your photos with us, your stories, your passion for uh, for not just insects but for all of the natural world. It, it's uh, it's uh, great to see that some of these things through your eyes that I may not see through my eyes. So. So thank you for that. Thank you for everybody else who joined us. We hope you'll come back and join us again in some of these future events. Uh, thank, thank you for having me, and I enjoyed it too, Maurice. I hope I didn't talk too much. I'm a talker. You know that. No, that's, <laughs> that's why we reached out to you. I knew I could count on you for that. And it's been a very enjoyable uh, 
very enjoyable time together. Good, good, good. I enjoyed it. All right. Well, thanks, everybody. And, uh, you know, Bye. please send us any ideas of things you'd like to see that we don't have on the calendar because we're going to keep this going as long as we can. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Bye-bye.